Our speaker today is an accomplished artist, painter, business entrepreneur, mother of three independent daughters and soon three amazing son-in-laws. She is currently working as a hospice chaplain, serving patients and their families at the end of life. And she can now add to her credits, proud, supportive spouse of NVC's 2022 Chili Cook-Off champion, Tom Frisbee. Please help me welcome my friend, Reverend Lori Frisbee. Good morning, NBC. Ah, oh, look at all these beloveds in the sanctuary. And to those of you tuning in, welcome, welcome, welcome. I see old friends and new friends, and I am so blessed. I have my husband here, my mom here, and my best friend for over 40 years here. Wow, I am truly blessed. So, wow, there's a lot packed into this short little talk today. This week we are finishing our series on the foundations of science of mind, and you can find it in the science of mind text that was written by Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our teaching. And it doesn't matter if you're brand new to this teaching, or if you've been studying it a long time, like I have, um, because there's always something new, new to uh, discover and to walk through. I'd also like to say that our, you know our mission here is to teach spiritual living and to live spiritual teaching. Well, I have to tell you, this talk title worked me for an entire month, <laughs> and I did get to practice. So let's dive in. Um, I'd like to review quickly what the last few chapters covered just to bring us up to the present moment. The fabulous Reverend Karen Russo, the master of the money keys, she kicked off our series and she talked about the thing itself. Now the thing itself, it doesn't matter what you call it. I like to use the word God or spirit, the divine. Um, but there are so many ways that we can call it life, light, universal presence, source. And the nugget that I walked away with was that everything, and I do mean everything, is God. It is love. It is God. It is in the light and the dark. It is in the problem and the solution. Because there's no place where spirit is not. In chapter two, my good friend, and he's a practitioner and a ministerial student. I love and adore him, Ron Tronnell. He spoke about how it works. And Ron, the, the nugget that I walked away with was that God can only work for us as it works through us. He spoke about the nature of God, that God is love. And God created everything out of itself, and it imparted within us that seed of perfection. So that's already within me, and it's already within you. We're given the freedom of choice, and we're given the opportunity to co-create with spirit the life of our dreams. In chapter 3, our beloved Reverend Karen Lewis minister, senior minister here, she shared with us about what it does. She talked about the creative process, and she talked about law. The takeaway here was that law always responds to us. Always. It's impersonal. It doesn't take sides. What we plant in infinite mind outpictures in our reality. Ernest Holmes wrote, there is a power for good in the universe. It is greater than we are, and we can use it. Which brings me to my 
my topic today. I'm talking about the, the fourth chapter, which is how it works. And the nugget here is prove it. Prove it. Okay. Huh. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> so I think most of us could agree that human nature is to want more, to be more, and to experience more. We want to see that evidence out plain right now. Right now. So um, I remember the movie, it said, God, show me the money. Well, show me the love. Let me see the demonstration in my own life. And I thought about these questions. How can the science of mind impact my life? How can it transform those burdens and those conflicts and those, that stinking thinking that we carry around? How can the teachings of science of mind bring about more joy, more love, more peace, more harmony, more health? Hmm. These are great questions. Great questions. As the new year unfolded, I looked at my own burdens that I was carrying over from last year, and I felt kind of a heave of emotions that were swirling all around me. I noticed anger and sadness and disappointment, frustration. Hmm. I had some unmet expectations. I thought I'd see all my kids at Christmas. I felt sad for my daughter and disappointed that she had to postpone her wedding. I was angry at COVID and I was frustrated with some of the politics that was going on and, and the unrest that's happening in our country and around the world. That's a lot. That's a lot. I knew that I needed to see things differently which is clarity. I needed to practice the tools that I had learned along the way, the principles that I carry in my back pocket and in my heart. So let's start with clarity and practice, okay? Clarity is about looking at these situations, these boulders, these burdens with fresh eyes. Can we really look at it with the eyes of God? Hmm. We don't deny that the rent is due on Friday and our bank account says, whoo, 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 not yet. We don't deny the physical experience of a broken arm or an ailment that is affecting us on a daily basis. We don't deny our sadness with the loss of a job, of a home, or of a loved one. We can pause. And we can expand our awareness to see these conditions with fresh eyes as God sees them. Practice is about filling our tank each and every day with positive messages, surrounding ourselves with friends who walk this journey with us. Those daily text affirmations from our great inspirator, Reverend Leslie, is a great way to just dive in and pause for just a moment every day then you can face those conditions. Once we identify the problem or the concern, we must awaken our consciousness, expand our thinking to a metaphysical level. That is beyond the physical. Up, we, we lift our thoughts to a place that is a higher realm. So seeing things differently reminded me of the story of Sisyphus. Now, some of you might know Sisyphus. 
Some of you may not, and I invite you to go look him up because I use him a lot. Sisyphus was a great king. He was a prosperous king of Greek mythology, and he, he built the prosperous city of, of Corinth. But Sisyphus was also known as a great trickster. Now, I'm not going to give you the full story. I'm just going to give you the abbreviated one. So Sisyphus was a trickster, and he decided to trick death and get out of it. Well, huh. Zeus subsequently punished him and said he must roll this boulder up a hill for all of eternity. He could never get to the top because it would always roll back down. Each and every time he had to start over and push this boulder, this condition, up a hill, and then it would roll back down. Isn't that pretty defeating? We have this thing and it just keeps happening over and over again. Hmm. Well, in this myth, Sisyphus believed that Zeus held all the power. He just accepted his lot in life. Well, I don't know about you, but I would not like being stuck with someone else's condemnation of me for all of eternity. That would be a big burden, a big boulder. So in the teachings of science of mind, which I dearly love, it says we believe that we are free to choose new thoughts and plant new seeds. Take new actions to realize our dreams. Ernest taught us that the principle is not bound by precedent. Just because someone said something, it, it doesn't make it true. Making a mistake in the past doesn't bind us to that automatically for eternity. I took a, a new look, a fresh look, at some of those conditions that I was experiencing in my own life. Albert Camus also looked at this story. He was a French existentialist, and he saw Sisyphus's boulder as Sisyphus's purpose in life his cross to bear, his object of being. This boulder was actually the, the one thing that was going to bring him closer to God. Huh, interesting concept, huh? We got a problem? Closer to God? Hmm. This idea is very much in alignment with science of mind principles. We're not bound uh, for eternity because of those past mistakes or erroneous thoughts, we are free in this moment to choose new choices. We can practice to see God, to see things as God sees them. What if Sisyphus had just paused? Taking a time out. He's halfway up the hill. He sees the boulder and he thinks, hey, what if I just stuck a shim in it? Hmm. Well, a shim gives us a pause. It allows us to do our work. It stops something in, it tra in its tracks. It allows us to do our work. It also balances and stabilizes things. So a shim is an important item. It can fill a void. And it's a tiny little thing that we can use every day. So... If Sisyphus had put a shim under that rock to gain some clarity, imagining a new life, something else he'd like to experience. And what if by using this shim, Sisyphus found some inner peace and recognized that seed of perfection that already existed within him? What if he saw that boulder as a symbol of past choices or some outside influence? 
and began imagining a life he'd like to live. Could Sisyphus have changed his thinking and changed his life? Perhaps he got to the top of the hill and somersaulted down the other side and he slid right into the life that he imagined, grinning from ear to ear. I believe he could. Okay. So, I'm going to come to point two. Casting the burden. Well, as those feelings were coming up for me after the new year, things were swirling all around me. I contacted my prayer partner, Jane, beautiful woman, and she pulled out this book, The Collected Works of Florence Scovel Shin, another metaphysical writer, new thought leader. And in there is a little chapter called Casting the Burden. Casting the burden is turning our awareness to that perfection within. It is lifting our awareness to God, spirit, the divine, the thing itself, our higher power. It is the Christ or spirit within us. Jesus spoke about it in the Bible when he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It was because he had overcome the vibration of the world's effects. Instead, he was trusting that inner divinity, that inner light within him. That there was a power greater than he was, and it was within him. Florence wrote, our battles, our problems, and our questions are gods to solve. We need to just get out of the way. She went on, it is the superconscious mind or the spirit within which fights man's battles and relieves him of his burden. She offered this affirmation. I cast this burden of, and you can fill in the blank, violence, I like that one because today's a season of nonviolence, resentment, frustration, judgment, fear, sadness. I cast this burden to the spirit within me, and I go free to be loving, harmonious, and happy. Why don't we repeat that? I, you can do this silently or you can do it out loud. I'm okay. I cast this burden of, fill in the blank, to the spirit within me, and I go free to be happy, or to be loving, harmonious, and happy. Isn't that powerful? I tell you, I'm getting goosebumps. I'm sorry. That just lifted me out of my sadness. That I can turn to this at any moment. I cast this burden, not to some guy in the sky, but to, to that light within me. And I go free. I saw casting the burden in another light. Casting the burden is also assigning meaning and direction to the conditions in our life. Yes, God is animating us, and we have the freedom to direct it. We have the freedom to decide what that burden is and how it affects my life. We're not promised an easy life, but we are promised guidance from that which gave us life. I had a patient just recently, and she said, what God sends before me equip, equips me to see my way through it. So I looked it up. Where God guides, God provides. That's kind of an abbreviated version of a passage in Isaiah. We can use the power of our word to co-create with God. And then we must be receptive. We must be willing 
to receive the good that we've planted in superconscious mind. Point three, stand firmly in faith. The opposite of faith is fear. Isn't fear just misdirected energy? And isn't it faith that neutralizes all fear? There, it, there is no peace or happiness for man until he has erased all fear from his subconscious. Faith. Why does it appear that some prayers are answered and others are not? Ernest reminds us, if prayer was ever answered for one person, then it is answered for everyone. It works the same. It's like gravity. Gravity's going to work the same for you or for you or for me. Faith makes the difference. God does not pick and choose that you get a little and you don't. Florence Scovelshin stated it this way. When man knows his own power and the workings of his mind, his great desire is to find an easy and quick way to impress the subconscious with good, for simply an intellectual knowledge of the truth will not bring results. Faith is the juice that activates our affirmative prayers. It is the supercharge, the turbo boost. It is remembering who we are. Ernest tells us we can rest in complete confidence that our words make this faith. In Mark, it says, whatever you, whatever you seek through prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Florence told a quick little story about sighting land. And the in it, she said, a lady wanted to set a china. She prayed on it, prayed on it. And one day, a friend gave her a, a plate. It had a small crack in it. And she said, well, wait a minute. I prayed for a whole set of china. And all I got was this cracked plate. And Florence said, well, wait a minute. It's a glimmer. It's, it's something that's coming. Your good is on its way. It's like the sailors who were looking for land. They can't see it yet, but they see birds, and they see seaweed, and they see twigs on the water. Have faith. Your good is on its way. I have a close friend, and we call those God glimmers. And we, we praise them, we are grateful for them, and we celebrate them. When we see them, we know we're on the right path. Lastly, I want you to marvel at the manifestation before you ever see it. Believe that it is yours. Everything originates in mind first and comes into form through us. Ernest wrote, faith is a mental attitude that is so convinced of its idea which so completely accepts that any contradiction is unthinkable or impossible. Let's sum this up. Hmm. This week, I invite us to take a mental inventory. See where your thoughts are. Are you in the negative camp? You know, complaint, misery, problem. Or are you in the positive camp? Things are looking up. You're, you're practicing harmony, forgiveness, compassion, joy. I've heard that for every negative thought, we need three positive thoughts to undo that groove and get us in a new dynamic. Our call to action is shim. See God in all things. Have clarity and see with the eyes of God. Discern carefully those conditions. Here with heart. H. This is the reminder to get quiet. To recognize the one presence. The love. I. Inspired action. 
we listen and we become aligned with that. Ah, oh, that one presence. We trust God in every action. The law must work through us to work for us. And marvel at the manifestation. Give it thanks in advance. Believe it before you see it. Notice the glimmers or the tiny clues. Stay the course. Stand firmly in faith. Thank you. Please join me in an affirmative prayer. There is only one life, one beautiful, glorious activity that is breathing itself in and through all creation. Ah, this beautiful essence, this beautiful divine presence, it is everything that is seen and everything that is unseen and yet formed. I know this presence is imbuing itself in and through and as me right here right now as love and as joy as peace as harmony and as I know that truth for me I know it for each and every one here and within the sound of my voice we are one we are God God is and I am, we are. And I speak a word of blessing on behalf of each and every one of us gathered here today. That we push that boulder aside, that we cast our burden to that light presence within us and realize those beautiful seeds that we are planting. More joy, more peace, more love, more harmony, more grace for us and our planet. I am so grateful for each and every person who had a hand in this service today. I bless their time, their talent, and their treasure. I bless each of us as we go forward this week, practicing Shim, seeing God, hearing with heart taking inspired action and marveling at the manifestation before it appears. On this I stand. I am so grateful. I let it go and I let it be. And so it is.